At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that there are angels in heaven Always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander away. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Thanks, Stephen. And thanks for leading. And uh, Stephen didn't mean to apologize for long Bible readings. He was just being polite. He loves the Bible. You love the Bible. Uh, and we're going to look at it now. Uh, let's pray. Our good God, we thank you for your love, for your care and your goodness. We thank you that uh, you're a God who loves us so deeply.
that you think about the details of our lives, you think about the hardships we endure, uh, you think about us imperfect people living in community in an imperfect way, and your grace is so good and so uh, expansive that it even applies to times in our lives when things are harder. It even applies to our lives when things don't go well. Uh, because you're a God who loves us genuinely, and so you deal with all the different messy details of our lives. Lord, we are weak in ourselves. We are slow to understand. Uh, and so we come to you this morning, especially uh, asking you to speak to us by your word and by your spirit. We want to rest completely on you so that you uh, can speak to us most clearly. Uh, Lord, we ask that you'd give us open hearts and open minds. Uh, please be with us now. And we know that you hear us because we pray to you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, there's a saying that goes, there's no such thing as a stupid question. We've all heard that saying. And we know that there's uh, truth to that saying. But if we are brutally honest, we know that at some time, some questions that people ask just show that they, they don't get it. For example, I was speaking to a, a senior leader of the organization, and they were telling me how they uh, deal with staff. And uh, you know, when they hire staff first, they might hire someone who has an inflated ego and has great confidence, and that staff member, that inflated ego, managed to carry them through the initial phases of the hire, but they soon prove that they don't have the necessary skills. So organizations have this period called a probation period where they can kind of let the staff go before the staff becomes permanent. So anyway, you'll come to uh, a situation where you have someone who's arrogant, who doesn't know their job, they frustrate other staff, and they come into the probation interview, all deluded, and they ask uh, the senior manager, so what do I need to do to be promoted? Now, now that's a stupid question, because at that point, their jobs are really at stake. A more intelligent question would be, how can I keep my job? Well, well the similar thing is happening in today's passage. The disciples... Jesus' followers are going along with him, and they ask Jesus, uh, now who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus tells them, that's the wrong question. If you are concerned about who is the greatest of, in the kingdom of heaven, you don't really understand what it means to enter the kingdom of heaven. In fact, Jesus says uh, to them, truly, unless you become humble, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now this is quite surprising because notice that in this passage that Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's not speaking to the public sinners, no. He's not speaking to the Pharisees who rejected him. He's not speaking to the, to the Roman world out there. No, he's speaking to his followers, those who profess faith in him, those who recognize him as Lord and Savior, and he's telling them, unless you humble yourselves, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. So we are going to look at this passage today because it applies to us too, because we all follow the Lord Jesus Christ, and we don't want to be guilty of pride, which disqualifies us from the kingdom of heaven. So let's look at entering the kingdom of heaven, dealing with, with sin. Our first point is, be humble. Um, read verse 1 to 5 with me. It will be on your screen there. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a little child to them and said, and placed the child there and he said, uh, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes such a child in my name welcomes me. So think about it. The disciples now, they follow Jesus all along. We come to Matthew 18. They know that Christ is the Son of God. They know that God's kingdom is coming. So what's the, 
question, well, if God's kingdom is coming, how do we organize ourselves to have the most prominent positions in God's kingdom? And then Jesus calls a little child among them. Back in the first, these days, children are rightly viewed as precious and as important. Uh, back then in the first century, children were perceived as small and insignificant. And Jesus brings this little child among them and says, unless you become like this little child, in other words, unless you realize that you are small and insignificant, and unless you humble yourselves, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That means, to be a Christian means that we need to humble ourselves, we need to recognize that we are small and insignificant. Uh, it's quite unnatural for human beings like ourselves to humble ourselves because pride is uh, so much at the root of our heart. Pride is the sin that caused Adam and Eve to sin in the Garden of Eden. Uh, so it's not normal, it's not natural to simply want to humble ourselves. God's Spirit has to work in our hearts so that we could humble ourselves. Uh, you may have heard of how C.S. Lewis came to faith. It wasn't an easy thing for Lewis to come to faith because he was an academic, he was accomplished, he was quite proud. And he writes of his conversion as this, as, as kicking, struggling, resentful, looking for every chance to escape. And he, and he writes this, you must picture me alone in my room in Oxford, night after night, feeling that whenever my mind lifted, even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him, whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had last come upon me. In 1929, I gave in. I admitted that God was God, knelt and prayed. Perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. You see, Lewis is describing his conversion experience, and it really is about him being humbled by God's Spirit. God's grace, God's Spirit, force him to recognize how humble, how small, and how insignificant he is. To be a Christian is to be humbled. Humbled so that we can depend on God's love. It's only when we realize that we are small and insignificant, we can depend on God's good love. And Jesus is telling his disciples here, unless you are humble, you will miss out on the kingdom of heaven. So it's a warning to his disciples. And so it should be a warning to all professing Christians. I mean, how often has the church, the wider church, uh, been exposed to have not deal with pride and sin in the church? Uh, the Puritan Richard Mayo said that pride is a big-bellied sin. Most of the sin, most sins are the offspring of, of pride. And the Puritan points out, um, that jealousy, judgmental attitude, hypocrisy, and even gossip are the offspring of pride. So basically, uh, Jesus is saying here, if we want to enter the kingdom of heaven, we need to humble ourselves, realize how small and insignificant we are, so that we could depend on God's grace. So what are the implications of that, of being humble? It means that we deal with sin. Let's look at our second point. Cut off personal sin. We're looking at entering the kingdom of heaven. Our first point was to be humble. Our second point is to cut off personal sin. So follow the conversation here. Jesus has just brought a little child in among them and he's told his disciples, unless you become like this little child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So this little child represents believers, right? And then he says in verse 6, that's on the screen, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it will be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned into the depths of the sea. So Jesus is saying that when proud people cause humble believers to stumble, those proud people will be punished so severely, it would be better for them to be, to be drowned. This is quite concerning. Uh, 
The, the church at large does not have a great reputation in dealing with proud people who cause humble believers to stumble. Yes, many aspects of the church do deal with that, but there's times when it becomes uncomfortably clear that the church has not effectively dealt with it. For example, uh, we've had a few royal commissions in the last few years. One was on how the aged care system runs. Uh, and we've flinched there when it showed that church organizations have not dealt well with the weak and the vulnerable. We've had royal commissions into uh, child abuse, and we've also flinched when you thought, when you saw people who professed that they were Christian, yet they covered up sin, not dealt well with the small and the insignificant here. Now, those are extreme cases, but how often have you come to a church where you have proud people causing the average weaker person to be discouraged, to stumble? Here, Jesus is saying that God is going to deal with those proud people who cause the humble to stumble here. And this uh, suddenly is so serious that Jesus speaks in hyperbole, you know, exaggerated terms to, to show that everyone uh, who believes in him must decisively deal with our sin if we want to enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, look at what verse 8 says there. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or, cris or crippled than to have two hands and two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to, enter two, uh, to, than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. So when believers don't deal with our personal sin, Jesus is saying, we cause others to stumble. And that is a dangerous thing. And he uses the parable there of the shepherd and the sheep. Notice how that fits within the narrative. Uh, if a farmer, a shepherd, has a uh, hundred sheep, one of them wanders off, uh, he leaves the 99 to go and find that one. And Christ is saying there, God cares especially about the weak and the insignificant, the humble believer. So if we don't deal with our personal sin and we cause the humble believer to be discouraged, to be despondent, to stumble, God's going to deal with us. So the message is cut off personal sin if we want to enter the kingdom of heaven. But notice this cutting off sin doesn't only apply to our personal lives, it also applies to the church. Let's look at our third point, cut off corporate sin. Uh, read verse 15 onwards with me. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So Jesus is saying here, yeah, just as how we deal with personal sin quite decisively, we cut it off, we amputate personal sin. We need to deal with significant sin in the church so that the offender will repent. How does this work? What is the wider teaching of the Bible on this uh, topic here? Well, our first Bible reading from 1 Corinthians 5 expanded on that. Um, in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul is speaking to a church, and that church is tolerating sin amongst its members. And uh, he writes in verse 9, in my letter to you, I told you not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of the world who are immoral, greedy, swindlers, idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral, greedy, idolater, slander, drunkard, or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? 
Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. So the teaching of the Bible is to confront sin. Not to hide sin, but to confront sin. So notice in the Matthew passage, Jesus tells his disciples, if your brother or sister sins, go. There's an imperative there. There's a command there. If your brother or sister sins, go. The loving thing to do for a person who is in sin is to help them confront the sin so that they will turn back to God. Now, we all uncomfortable with this teaching because it sounds so judgy. I mean, Jesus, uh, Paul says judge. Jesus is sounding pretty judgmental there, isn't he? But notice what's going on here. Christ is saying, if we really love the sheep, if we really love people, we ought to confront them so that they will not be lost. It's not a crazy idea. We all know about this. We all are of tough love. For example, if a parent has a, uh, a, a child who's struggling with drug addiction, they don't give their children money. They said, no, stop, put yourself into a rehabilitation center, and then we can help you through this thing. Uh, they understand that the stakes are high. The, per the child's life is in danger. Their well-being is in danger. Here, Christ is saying, the eternal well-being is in danger. Go confront sin. Uh, there's a second reason to deal with sin here. In 1 Corinthians passage, uh, Paul uses a baking analogy. In 1 Corinthians 6, he says, Don't you know that a little yeast leavens a whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. You know, when you bake... A uh, few friends came and visited us, and uh, she gave us a sourdough starter, which is really kind of a yeast. And when you bake, you don't need much yeast. You just need a bit of it, and the entire loaf, the yeast works itself through the entire loaf. In the morning, you come to the thing, and it's really quite puffy. And Paul is using that analogy to describe sin in the church. And Paul is saying, it's a common sense thing he's kind of pointing out here. If you don't deal with sin, it harms the entire body. Unrepentant sinner who calls themselves a Christian uh, causes problems for the whole church. So does this mean that every sinner should be confronted and every sin should be exposed and everyone should be excluded from church? No, it doesn't mean that. If the church was a place where there weren't sinners, uh, if, the, if, if it meant not being a sinner, you, you, you needed to not be a sinner to be in church, the church will be empty, isn't it? Because we are all sinners. Paul is referring here to significant sin. And he mentions some of those significant sins, and the Bible mentions it. So he's talking about sexual immorality, uh, talking about slander. In Titus he says, warn a divisive person once, then a second time, then have nothing to do with them. He's talking about significant, unrepentant sin. And Paul is telling the church, confront it, deal with it. If the person is still unrepentant by those interventions, then remove them. The idea here is one of restoration. Notice the idea is uh, warn them, warn them, then put them out. In other, in other places in Scripture, Paul explains the rationale is so that you may win them back by pointing them to their sin. So as Jesus said, you need to amputate sin, cut off hands and gouge out eyes, speaking in hyperbole. So too, we need to deal with unrepentant sinners who persist in significant sin. So this cutting off sin is called repentance. Uh, repentance is quite a uh, buzzword in the Christian circles these days. I don't know if you've seen uh, some quotes by uh, uh, soccer people, I mean soccer, uh, <laughs> um, footy people who talk about repentance and made themselves quite unpopular. And uh, I watched uh, Q&A the other night, a recording of Q&A, uh, because Martin Isles was there on Q&A talking about repentance. And lots of Christians were, were saying that he really spoke well, and I watched his recording, and he really spoke well about repentance, which is this cutting off sin and turning to Christ 
And uh, he, he spoke very lovingly and graciously in this panel, public panel Q&A, and he told them, you know, the, the best news of my life was the day I realized that I needed to repent. I needed to turn away from us and cut off sin and follow Christ. And his uh, guests over there were very uh, uncomfortable with it. But Christians like me, like you I'm sure, were encouraged by his grace and courage which showed that, well, if you're gonna follow Christ, we need to repent from sin. It's not a popular teaching. So he didn't receive any support from his non-Christian uh, guests over there, but we believers supported him. I was wondering though, what if Martin Isles said something like this? You know, sin is, is such a problem. The church needs to confront sin in our own ranks. Christians in the church need to repent from sin. We need to look at sin in our ranks and turn away from it, deal with it, confront it. It's not right. We will not get into heaven simply by proclaiming allegiance to Christ. We must turn to Christ both personally and corporately. Well, then I reckon that uh, Martin Isles would probably have far fewer Christian followers. You see, we would like to point out sin in the world and tell the world, ah, repent, you know, you're gonna go to hell if you don't do this, that, and the other, and that's true. You need to turn to Christ. But when God's judgment and God's justice homes in on us, uh, then we're slightly more uncomfortable, isn't it? Christ is saying here, in no uncertain terms, go, deal with corporate sin. So now this teaching of humbling ourselves and repentance sounds so difficult. Does it mean that uh, if we want to enter the kingdom of heaven, we have to earn our way there, we have to humble ourselves, we need to cut off sin, and then we somehow get into the kingdom of heaven? No. No, and, and Jesus, very helpfully, Matthew includes the parable here about forgiveness. So let's look at the passage on forgiveness. Our fourth point is forgive. And only when we understand God's grace and forgiveness do we understand anything in this passage. So at the end of the passage, Peter asks Jesus now. Peter asks some silly questions along the way. But by this time, he's been with Jesus for a while. He knows how these things work. He's wisened up. He knows that the kingdom of heaven is about grace. So back then, the uh, Jewish rabbis said, you can forgive a person once and twice. And even a third time. The fourth time, you don't forgive them. So Peter is smart here. He says, uh, Jesus, um, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister's sins? You know what? I'll double it. Up to seven times? Probably expecting Jesus to say, well done, Peter. You finally get it. No. He says, if you keep in count of sin, you have missed out on understanding God's mercy and forgiveness in the first place. There was this, there was this uh, servant who owed his master an unpayable debt, 10,000 bags of gold. Master wrote it off. Servant went and found someone else who owed him just a few bits uh, by, in comparison. Choked that person. The king heard about this and said, you wicked servant, I wrote off your, your huge debt. And here you go and condemn your brother for the small debt. You don't really understand what the kingdom of heaven is about. He's teaching Peter here and us here. Uh, notice the king had him tortured, uh, that wicked servant. Uh, Jesus is teaching Peter here and us here that if we truly want to understand what it means to humble ourselves, what it means to deal with sin both personally and corporately, what it means to forgive, we first need to understand the great debt that God has forgiven us in the first place. This only makes sense if we understand what great sinners we are and how gracious God has been in forgiving us. The gospel is this. We are these huge sinners who owed God this unpayable debt. God, in his great mercy, sent his only son to die for us and pay the debt to be raised to life so that we could have eternal life. We are recipients of that grace. If we have received that grace, shouldn't we be gracious people, showing God's grace to others? 
So if you're finding it difficult from this passage to humble yourselves, if you're finding it difficult to cut off personal sin, confront corporate sin, the gospel invites you to focus on God's grace first. Uh, if all this thing is not making sense to you, think about God's grace in the first place. A few years back, we had uh, good family friends who were going through a very difficult time in their marriage. They both were and are Christian, but the husband had an affair. He confessed his affair to his wife before anyone found out, and uh, he put an end to it. And you can imagine the trauma that his wife was going through, the heartache and the struggle she was going through. Yet uh, her friends in church, we were one of them, um, asked her, like, how was she managing through all of this? Because she was dealing with it well, considering all that had happened. Uh, but her faith, her faith seemed strengthened. And she said, I remember words clearly. She says, you know, during this time where I see all of the sin and all of that, I had to think about whether I really believe the gospel. And I'm glad to say I really do. In other words, she understood what God forgiving her personal sin was so she could show grace to others. So Christians, we understand how the great debt of sin that God has written off uh, us. And so we can be humble. And so we can have the courage to deal with personal sin, the courage to confront corporate sin, and the grace to forgive. Let's pray. We thank you, God, for your word, for your message, for the teaching of Scripture, which is clear. Uh, we thank you that you don't leave us muddled and confused about how to deal with tough situations, because uh, as if your gospel only ap uh, applied to perfect theoretical conditions. No, uh, your gospel applies to sinful people like us, living in a community like ours. Lord, we ask that the truth of your gospel might not be lost, uh, that we would understand what it is to be sinners, understand what it is to have our sins forgiven so that we will be humbled. It is impossible for us to be humbled on our own. It's impossible for us to have any courage to deal with our personal sin or corporate sin unless your spirit shows us uh, the stakes that I play. Uh, so uh, we ask your good God to please work in our hearts by your spirit. We ask that you'd please comfort us uh, because after all said and done, uh, we have a gospel of mercy and grace. We have a gospel that promises us forgiveness in Christ Jesus. We ask that that gospel might take hold of our lives on a practical level so that we may live it out to show that we really believe the gospel in the first place. Please be with us now as we, uh, we continue. Uh, please work in our hearts by your spirit in the week and months ahead. And we ask this all in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.